My name is Dr. Shruti Sharma and today I will be talking on a subject that's as elusive as the perfect cup of coffee on a Monday morning. Climate finance. Now I know what you are thinking. Climate finance. Isn't that just a fancy term for throwing money at mother nature and hoping she'll fix everything? No, the subject is of global importance that transcends borders and touches the very essence of our planet's future. First and foremost, let us acknowledge that there is no universally agreed upon definition of climate finance. However, in general terms, it refers to funding, whether local, national or transnational, aimed at combating the challenges posed by climate change. Its primary objectives are the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and the enhancement of carbon sinks. All while reducing the vulnerability of human and ecological systems to the adverse impacts of climate change. In 2009, the world witnessed a historic milestone with the pledge of a $100 billion annual climate finance goal. This commitment was further solidified in the Paris Agreement, where developed countries pledged to provide this sum annually by 2020 to support developing countries in their climate change efforts. Article 9 of the Paris Agreement underscored the obligation of developed countries to provide financial resources to assist their developing counterparts in tackling climate change challenges. Yet, it is crucial to note that the $100 billion goal was not the result of negotiations and regrettably fall short of addressing the climate challenges faced by developing nations. Recent reports such as Stern Snow Gray report of 2022 indicate that we will require a staggering $1 trillion per year in external climate finance by 2030. The UNFCCC Standing Committee on Climate Finance's estimates even reach between $5.8 to $11.5 trillion. Despite these daunting figures, the reality remains sobering. In 2020, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development OECD, reported that only $83.3 billion of the promised $100 billion was provided to developing and emerging economies. Moreover, a significant portion of this assistance came in in the form of loans, both concessional and non-concessional. To facilitate the provision of climate finance, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change established a financial mechanism. Within this framework, we find institutions like the Global Environment Facility, GEF, which provides grants and blended finance for projects across various domains, including biodiversity, climate change and international waters. GEF operates as a unique partnership comprising 18 entities including UN agencies, multilateral development banks, national entities and international NGOs. Another crucial player is the Green Climate Fund, GCF, established in 2010 to expand collective human action in response to climate change. It operates as an entity accountable to COP with policies, program priorities and funding eligibility criteria decided upon by the conference. Further bolstering climate finance, we find two special funds, the Special Climate Change Fund, SCCF, and the Least Developed Countries Fund, LDCF, both managed by the GEF. Additionally, the Adaptation Fund established under the Kyoto Protocol in 2001 plays a pivotal role in addressing climate change challenges. The UNFCC also known as the Rio Convention, forms the backbone of international efforts to combat dangerous human interference with the climate system. It entered into force in 1994 and has been the stage for scientific research, negotiations, discussions and agreements aimed at sustainable climate change mitigation and adaptation. Milestones in the global climate arena include the UN Climate Change Conference, COP26, in Glasgow in 2021, where nations recognized the urgency of climate action, reaffirming the goal to limit global warming to well below 2 degrees. 
above pre-industrial levels and pushing towards 1.5 C target. The importance of reducing carbon dioxide emissions by 45 percent to achieve net zero emissions around mid-century was also stressed alongside commitments to phase out coal power and fossil fuel subsidies. India pledged to source half of its energy from renewables by 2030 and to achieve carbon neutrality by 2070. Moving to COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt in 2022, it resulted in key agreements such as funding for vulnerable countries impacted by climate disasters. A continued commitment to the 1.5 C target and increased accountability for businesses and institutions. It was also an acknowledgement of the climate emergency and the need for stronger action. As we look forward to COP28 in Dubai in 2023, the conference aims to prioritize inclusivity and accessibility, raise ambition in mitigation efforts and focus on the global goal on adaptation and financial objectives. So how does this new climate fund benefit India? India has welcomed this move although it has faced some criticism for countries like US and a few European nations. For India, which is heavily reliant on agriculture and experiences significant climate change impacts in the sector, the loss and damage fund represents a crucial transition. It can aid farmers in moving towards low carbon development even though India has excluded agriculture transition from its nationally determined contributions NDCs to avoid burdening farmers. Looking ahead, climate finance is expected to receive a significant boost in the upcoming budget of 2023-24, especially in light of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's commitment to achieving net zero in 2070. The Union Finance Minister is consulting with industry leaders and the budget is anticipated to include guidelines for climate financing. This could range from incentivizing private financing to providing incentives to large banks, supporting small operators, transitioning to renewable energy and offering financial supports to startups in the renewable energy sector. Furthermore, India is preparing to roll out carbon pricing, which has been approved by the lower house of parliament and will be tabled in the upper house during the upcoming winter season. This move is expected to impact the cost dynamics and capital intensity of carbon intensive sectors like power, metals and cement. Looking ahead, negotiations are focused on a new goal after 2025 called the New Collective Quantified Goal NCQG. This goal will involve joint efforts from both developing and developed countries to mobilize and deliver funds based on science-based assessments of needs and priorities. Deliberations began at COP26 and the aim is to establish this new goal by COP29 in 2024. Inclusing climate finance is not just an issue for governments and institutions. It is a collective responsibility that transcends borders, industries and generations. The challenges are daunting but they are not insurmountable. It is our duty as stewards of this planet to rise to the occasion to make bold commitments and to work towards together to secure a sustainable and an equitable future for all. Thank you.